afternoon, folks, and welcome to another one of our virtual tours of outer space. My name is Josh. I am broadcasting from my home to yours for our weekly chance for us to fly around our universe and see some of the really cool stuff that it has to offer. Now, our show every week has been run in the open space software, which is something that not only looks super cool, you can see it hovering in a window next to me, but it actually is something that you can use at home, too. Often when we talk about planetarium softwares, they can cost thousands and thousands of dollars for individual licenses, which makes sense. There's huge amounts of information in it. But fundamentally, a lot of these are publicly funded. They're taken, images taken from NASA information gained from our scientific missions. And that's information that the American taxpayer has paid for. So this is a software that comes to you completely free. It's funded by NASA. So if you want to check out Open Space and all the cool stuff it can do, download it and give it a shot. OpenSpaceProject.com is the place to go for it. Now, we are currently looking at something that's been on my mind a lot this week, which is our moon. I think we had a full moon last night. If you tune into our broadcast tomorrow, you can hear from Bing about all the cool names that this moon has. Cold moon is my personal favorite. But as I was flying around on the moon's surface, I got an absolutely captivating view, and it's one I really wanted to share with you. Across the cracked and craggly view of the moon, you can see the beginnings of Cassiopeia right up here popping out over the horizon and pointing the way towards the Andromeda galaxy. Now that's just a beautiful view. I don't know much about photography, but I know about the rule of thirds. So about two thirds of our screen is the moon right now. One third is space. You also want contrast. You want the craggly rocky surface of the moon with that stark dark background of space. And then you have a beautiful object of focus over there in the corner. That's our neighbor galaxy. I think that's a pretty cool shot. And it just happened to be where we started off our show today. Now, looking at our moon, you can see all sorts of amazing and beautiful stuff on the surface. But one of the cool things I think about our show today is that it's not just Josh flying around places he thinks are cool. We also have another Josh suggesting ideas. In the comments, I saw Josh Knight pop up. How about we go visit Neptune? I think that is a great suggestion. You can even suggest places to go visit if your name isn't Josh. So as we fly away from our home base in our solar system, the orbit of Earth and our moon, we are heading out to Neptune, which is a huge distance in space because Neptune is the farthest planet from the sun. I'm sorry, Pluto fans. It's not considered a planet anymore. And because of that, Neptune has claimed that title. I should say reclaimed that title because once upon a time, Neptune was the farthest known planet from the sun. And then we discovered Pluto and then we made Pluto not a planet. So Neptune became the farthest known planet. Again, kind of a fun trivia point. When we're looking at Neptune, we can see a beautiful surface, but you're not going to see a surface like the moon for a number of reasons. Number one, Neptune is an ice giant, not a rocky object. So when we see something change on the surface of Neptune, it tends to be cloud fluctuations. You can see this light spot right here, the dark bands, even a storm spot right there. But number two, we have higher resolution photos of the moon than we do of Neptune. When we talk about our images of the moon, they were taken by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and many other missions that give us ultra high resolution images, as well as an understanding of the topography, the change in height on Neptune's surface. When we look at Neptune, excuse me, on the moon's surface, when we look at Neptune, we don't see those changes because again, it's an ice giant, so it doesn't have rocky features. But number two, we've never had an orbiter go around Neptune. That might seem kind of a strange thing. We've sent missions out to so many planets. Why not Neptune? It's actually Neptune and Uranus. We have never sent a spacecraft to orbit either of them. Now, that's, to me, kind of a huge overstep. When we talk about our solar system, there are only eight planets. We've sent orbiters to, let's see, one, two, three, four, six of them, even though sending an orbiter to Earth is kind of a weird way to say that. When we talk about the surface of Neptune, we are looking at photos taken from the Voyager spacecraft from a long, long time ago. And some of the Hubble images give us a view of the surface. Now, I'm getting called out by you to you to you. I would still say that Nep uh, Pluto is a planet. So if we're only going by the major planet classification, you caught me. I should say Neptune is the farthest major planet from the sun. Thanks for checking me. So when we look at the surface of Neptune, we are seeing a beautiful blue color. And I think that is a really wonderful, really special thing because this is not an enhanced color image. That's the color we actually understand the surface to be. That's really cool. Now, some folks are saying they're only getting a static image. Let me give us a little bit more dynamic range. It's possible you're just seeing 
the blue planet without much surface detail. And that would be not a great thing. So let's go to some place we have a little bit higher resolution imagery of. I think Lara had a great suggestion. Let's go check out Pluto. Now, as pointed out, dwarf horses are horses. Dwarf galaxies are galaxies. Dwarf planets are, should be considered planets as well. When we talk about our dwarf planets, though, it's not just Pluto. We also have, I think, Haumea, Makemake, Ceres. Uh, when we're talking about the moon of Pluto, though, Sharon, I am a firm believer of whatever we call Pluto, we should be calling Sharon too. Now, I have to put a little asterisk there that turns out that's not a view widely held by the International Astronomer Union, so it's somewhat heretical. But when we look at Pluto, when we look at Sharon, they are very similar in size. They actually orbit one another. They have a single point in space that they're both going around. So it's wrong to say that Pluto is Sharon's moon and Sharon is Pluto's moon, but it kind of captures the idea. But when we look at Pluto, we can see a much more detailed surface than Neptune. Now, this is a little frustrating to me, I will say, because we understand Pluto a lot better than we do Uranus and Neptune. If you were to ask me, why do we know more about the surface of Pluto than those other places, I would say it's because Pluto was the American planet when it was discovered, the one and only planet ever confirmed by an American astronomer in the early ages or the earlier parts of the 20th century. That's pretty cool. I definitely think that we should study Pluto. I just think we should also be studying Uranus and Neptune. If anything, we have found tons and tons of Uranus and Neptune analogs in other solar systems. We haven't seen many Pluto-sized objects because Pluto-sized objects are hard to find even in our own solar system. So finding them around other stars is likely going to be a huge challenge. You can see Sharon off there in the background. For those of you who are classics fans, I will point out one of my favorite facts. If you're talking about the boatman who carries people across the River Styx, then it is Karen. If you're talking about the moon, astronomers like to say it. Sharon, I believe that's an homage to the astronomer who discovered its wife. So looking around here, you can see that beautiful surface of Pluto. It is an absolutely captivating place with tons of interesting features. If you want a deep dive on the high-res photos from the New Horizons mission that took this, there are a treasure trove, a whole smorgasbord of beautiful images for you to see. It is something really beautiful and really, really special. Now we had a question for Natalie about the asteroid belt. Let's see if we can take a trip there. I know I have Ceres loaded up. Last time I tried to bring in a whole bunch of asteroids, my computer got tremendously unhappy. If you want to find out about asteroids, though, we had a very special profile and a very special guest a couple weeks ago on our Cosmic Conversations, where we got to do a lot of exploring about the asteroid belt. That was a really cool opportunity to learn. So as we get closer and closer to Ceres, we can see its surface, and I think the absolute coolest feature on Ceres. I like to think of them as the Jawa eyes. If you're a Star Wars fan, you might get the reference, the little glowing peaks poking out from the middle of this crater. We actually discovered these are most likely deposits of water-soluble minerals, like Epsom salts, on the surface of Ceres. That's a really alliterative sentence and kind of hard to say. Now, when we look at the surface of Ceres, you can see that's even more alliterative. I like this. It's got topography, very interesting topography. This is a big crater, and something broke down deep enough for this liquid stuff to start flowing out. Once upon a time, we thought Ceres was dry, and that this is going to be just a barren rock, maybe with tiny traces of ice around its polar regions, like many barren rocky objects in our solar system. But today, we think of it as one of the wetter objects in our solar system, period. Earth, Europa, and Ceres seem to be the water objects in our solar system. Now, let's see if I can get... This is a really cool trifecta of craters I just saw. I guess quadrifecta? Check this out. I see one, two, three, four overlapping craters in terms of size. You could even say five, maybe, right here. A little tiny one. A, B, C, D, and E. And they're going up in terms of size. That is an absolutely fascinating feature I have never, ever noticed before. How cool. Kind of looks like one of those Fibonacci sequence diagrams. Now, poking around here, you can see very deep craters. This is an ancient object and one we think tells a long history of 
this world. And I just spotted one of my absolute favorite Syrian, Syrian features, which is a volcano right here next to a crater. Now there's a bump up and a divot down, and this gives you such a cool lighting contrast. When you look at them from the side, it's obvious. You can tell which one is a mountain, which one is a crater. But if I go and look at it from directly above, you can see the change in lighting. This is a dark side. This is a light side. That's a dark side. That's a light side. Now, this dark side versus light side technique has been used by astronomers examining photos taken from above for a very long time. It really helps you understand the topography before you have an uh, orbiting mission sending back that kind of imagery. Check this out, though. That is a huge crater, one of the polar ones. Reminds me of the one on Vesta, uh, an absolutely gigantic impact on that object long, long ago. Okay, we're zooming back. Now, as we're zooming back, let's see where else we should be heading. Ooh, we can target, I think, there are a couple other exosystems built. I don't have any loaded up. But what I can show you is where those exosystems, extrasolar planets, are hanging out by showing you the stars we have found with planets around them. So every single one of these blue markers is showing you the location of a star with at least one planet. And check this blob out. Right there, that blob is where the Kepler Space Telescope aimed itself for the duration of the mission, about four years. It spent staring at this little window. I think more than half of the exoplanets we know are right there because of Kepler's efforts. Absolutely phenomenal mission. And we are still learning a huge amount from what it did. But we're actually getting ready for our next major planet finder, which is TESS. So the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite is in space right now, and I cannot wait to see what they're discovering in terms of finding Earth-like planets nearby, not just any old kind of planet around any old kind of star. So as you look around here, you can see tons and tons of these spots. But I'm going to take a big step back. It looks like these things are covering the sky in every single direction you look. But we have spent a lot of time looking along the plane of our galaxy, as well as away from the plane, because we want to understand the population of planets around stars, where they could exist, where they might be absent. So I'm going to take us on a big step back so we get sort of the 3D perspective on where we're discovering this stuff. And I want to do that focused in this direction. Daniel, I promise we will get to your question because we are going to check this out on a galactic scale. Now, as we're zooming back, I want you to keep your eyes on this part of the sky right here. You can see one bright star, two bright stars, three bright stars, four bright stars, and the three stars for Orion's belt. That is Orion itself. Now, as we zoom back, that bright light in the center is our sun. As we're zooming back more and more, keep your eyes on Orion. He's right there. Now you can see some of the bright stars to Orion. And then back there is the Orion Nebula, where baby stars are forming. Most of the planets we have found around our own neighborhood are in every single direction. The Kepler field shot a huge distance out in one direction and showed us where we could find planets in that direction. Now, back here, I'm going to go in and see if I can turn on our galaxy. because That makes things look way cooler. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, I seem to have turned off the Milky Way. I swear we had this last week. Oh, well. But, let me if I get far enough back. Now we should be seeing something. When we talk about discovering objects in our own nearby part of the universe, we are seeing things largely in the Orion Spur. That is our chunk of the galaxy. And to answer Daniel's question... Do, 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 do. I saw it up there a second ago. Y'all are typing too many questions. This is great. So do the spiral arms of our galaxy rotate around the center? They absolutely do, because the disk of our galaxy is moving around the center of our galaxy. When we think about that, it's easy to think of it as like spinning, like streamers going around something. I would say that's not the most accurate representation, though. It's more like a record spinning. Now, that's a little funny because a record is a solid single object, 
whereas a galaxy is a floaty collection of stars. So how can they all spin as a unit? I would point you towards the amazing work of an astronomer named Vera Rubin and the rotational rates of galaxies and her incredible discovery about the strangeness of that rotation and why it is in fact counterintuitive and how that led to some of the first direct evidence for dark matter. So she had some really cool stuff to say about how we learn about the shape of a galaxy, its rotation, and what that can teach us about this unseen part of our own universe. Okay, let's see. Where should we head next? Red planet. That can only mean one place. Let's go check out Mars. Before I do that, though, I'm going to save some memory power by turning off our exoplanets. Okay, so any old trip to Mars could take quite a while. When we are traveling to Mars, it is key to pick the right window to launch something and have it land on the surface in a minimal amount of time. That's because Mars is a planet, Earth is a planet. We are both traveling around the sun and we are traveling at different speeds. Earth moves a little faster than Mars. So when we're coming into the swing, it's important to launch stuff. And when we're coming out of the swing, it's important for stuff to be landing. That's how we've decided missions should go to Mars. If we were sending humans, we wanted to obey the exact same set of rules. You don't want to leave humans in space for any longer than you have to. Any space travel is likely to be strenuous and deep space travel beyond the orbit of the moon is going to be extra, extra strenuous. I mean, can you imagine being locked in your small confines of your home for weeks or months at a time with minimal people to talk to? That would be difficult for anybody, right? Imagine only being able to reach out to your family and friends through things like Zoom or web chats. It would be really tough. So when we're talking about traveling to Mars, there are going to be a number of burdens, but the payoff would definitely be worth it. Right now, we are looking at one of Mars's absolute biggest tourist attractions. This is Olympus Mons. Now, climbing Olympus Mons, we talked about a couple weeks ago, probably not super strenuous compared to mountain climbing here. For those amazing human beings who have climbed El Capitan, either assisted or unassisted, they would laugh at you if you were bragging about climbing to the top of Olympus Mons, because it would pretty much be a gentle walk the whole time. Because it's so wide, even though it's three Everests tall, it wouldn't be much of a slope. You get rise over run, pretty inconsequential here. Now, there are steeper volcanoes on Mars, but the steepness of a volcano has a couple things to, a couple factors that go into it. Number one is the viscosity of the rock that makes it, which largely changes based on iron content. And this is pretty slippery rock. It doesn't build big chunky volcanoes or cones like we have here on Earth. It would puddle out nice and wide. But there hasn't been a volcano that went off on Mars in a very long time. So it's hard to say what current volcanism would be like, because there is none. Now, another factor that could go into it is gravity on the planet's surface. On a low, surf, low gravity surface, it's very easy to build taller things. Imagine how tall a sandcastle you could build on Pluto, where you're talking about like 1 16th of Earth's gravity. You could build some pretty precarious structures without them falling down. On a very high gravity world, like let's say a floating cloud platform on Jupiter, because there is no surface on Jupiter for you to build on, then you'd have the opposite problem. Any sandcastle you built would get squished flat pretty quickly. On Mars, it only has two-fifths, I believe, of Earth's gravity. So it would be a lot easier to build a tall sandcastle, and likewise, it would be easier to build a taller mountain. Now, it turns out deep valleys are also something of a specialty on Mars. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, because I feel like we visit it every other show, but check out Valles Marineris, that glowy quality. It's actually full of atmosphere. It is such a deep and gigantic uh, feature on the surface of Mars that it actually accumulates atmosphere. So from the bottom of Valles Marineris, it would be really horrible for astronomy. I saw a very cool question pop up from Roger. Why that one random direction for Kepler? Now, let me bring that back. I'm going to turn on our exoplanets on one more time. And we're going to look around. Check this out. When you're looking at the number of stars in the sky, there's quite a few stars over here. There's quite a few stars over here. But the most stars happen along the plane of our Milky Way. So if you had to pick a random chunk of sky to aim a telescope at to just watch for four years, and you wanted to get the most bang for your buck, the direction you would almost certainly choose is along the plane of the Milky Way. So where did they point? Right above the plane of the Milky Way. Why is that? Well, 
two reasons. Number one, looking directly into the plane, yes, you get the most stars, but you also get the most gas and dust. And the gas and dust would block the view of some of the stars and could make it hard to get the sensitive readings Kepler needed to identify the presence of planets. But you don't want to look too far from the plane of the Milky Way. I would say that's the second reason, because you still get the most stars. So a little bit away from the absolute darkest part of the plane, but still where you're getting a huge amount of stars, that's going to give you the most benefit for your spacefaring dollar, hence why the Kepler mission chose it. Now, we have a couple questions about the recent Jupiter and Saturn conjunction. When we saw it from the surface of Earth, you got to see Jupiter and Saturn very close in the sky. They are drifting apart, and that's a little sad for those of us who are fans of cool astronomical events. But, I mean, it's still awesome to see these two objects nearby in the sky. They're just getting farther and farther apart every day. Kind of backwards from the past few weeks where they've been getting closer and closer. So let's dive in to our very own planet Earth. And to make our lives a little easier, I'm going to turn on our planet trails. So that's going to show us where the planets are in their orbits around the sun. I'm going to turn off our exoplanets to save my computer a little bit of thinking space. And then we are going to look and see if we can spot where Jupiter and Saturn are. I'm willing to bet dollars to donuts, they are right there. We see them right after the sun sets, and they are still pretty dang close together. Now, if you wanted to see the actual conjunction, there's a cool thing you can do in open space, which is change the date. So if we go back to the 21st, we I don't want to make anyone nauseous. Then you can see they are right on top of each other, practically right next door. This was when planets were at their absolute closest. If you missed that and you want to see it sometime soon, I would say let's just go one month into the future from December 21st. Okay. And even over the next month, they are still going to be in the same part of the sky. They're just going to be drifting apart. Now, I realize that's not ideal. For a lot of us, we were really excited when they were so incredibly close together. But it's still cool to see these objects. And I would say don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. If you have the opportunity, still go out and look at them because either Jupiter or Saturn by itself is still a really impressive, really wonderful view. I'm going to crank us back to our current position. I can just click the button that says now. And let's see what they would look like tonight if you went outside. Well, you'd have one there and one there. They're medium far apart. But while they'd be outside a very zoomed in view, I would bet with the right long eyepiece, you could still get a pretty good view of both objects. Okay, so let's see. Something weird is happening. December uh, I have it set for tomorrow. Okay. This should be today. Is it the 30th? It's the 30th. Okay. So now, when we are looking at Jupiter and Saturn right there, whoops, changed my angle. Uh, folks wanted to zoom in. Well, that's the thing with the conjunction. It looks like the two objects are right on top of each other, but they're still about a billion miles apart. They just happen to be lined up from our perspective here on Earth. If Jupiter and Saturn did get close together in space, things would be pretty bad. Now, we like our planets where they are. If planets wandered significantly from where they orbit the sun, things could get a little nasty. But let's try something kind of cool. We had a request to go see the rings of Saturn from Happy. Okay. And if we see the rings of Saturn, this is a really cool view. Let's look towards the sun in the direction of Jupiter. And from Saturn, I'd be willing to bet you would see Jupiter very close to Earth in the sky. Isn't that kind of cool? So from the opposite end of this conjunction, if we had a spacecraft orbiting Saturn, which we don't, sigh, and it looked back towards Earth, you would see Jupiter and Earth in the same part of the sky. I think that would be a pretty awesome thing to see. Now, Daniel noticed that when you looked at Jupiter and Saturn, they didn't actually appear to be one planet. Now, I would agree. There were a lot of folks hyping that as they will appear as one object in the sky. And I will say when I walked outside, I did see a single point. But if you saw me at the beginning of this show, I wear glasses and I wear glasses for a very good reason. It's because my eyes aren't that good. 
people with better eyes were able to delineate the fact that there were two objects the entire time. They never got fooled. If you pointed a telescope or binoculars or anything, even a good camera on your phone that zoomed in, it became immediately obvious that these are two objects. They were separated by a small amount of a degree. That's very close in astronomical terms. And I think poetically minded people really seized on that and said they will appear as one object. But for the rest of us, especially people with good vision, they are still pretty far apart spatially. And even in the sky, they weren't really on top of each other. Mary wasn't fooled either. But I think Mary does have better vision than me when the times we've gone stargazing. OK, so I want to take us back one more time to planet Earth because we're getting a little close to the end of the show and we are about to cross a pretty cool moment for our planet. And what is that? Well, it's this random point in space that we humans have decided marks the end of a year. And it's kind of cool to think about that as Earth slides into this little corner of our solar system, that's the beginning and end point of the race our planet is running. We are about to cross the finish line and begin a new path around the sun. What we call a year is just one rotation all the way around. So we are about to cross that line and begin a new lap. That's going to be the end of 2020, which I think for a lot of us has been a little bit of a challenging year. But in a conversation with a friend today, they mentioned how important it is to remember these really positive things that we've learned. And I, for one, would say that what we're doing right now, sending out this show to an audience that hasn't set foot in our building, is a really cool thing something very special and a positive part of 2020 that I'm eager to keep doing in that new year. So as we cross this finish line, as we get ready to start our next lap around the sun, it's going to take 365 days. But over the course of that time, I hope we as a species can seize on some of the positive stuff and the challenges we've overcome, the stuff we've learned during 2020 and make 2021 a better year for all of us. So with that, I would like to thank you for joining me here for our very last virtual tour of outer space for 2020. I hope all of you have a wonderful New Year's and a great 2021. So from us at Morrison Planetarium and Open Space, thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your day.